Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. Uh, the Legendino is over in Rio, where it's midsummer. I'm here in Blighty, Tim, as you can see. Um, see what I've got with me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't go anywhere without it, mate. Hot water bottle. But you don't know anything about that, do you? It never no, gets I don't. This cold. I don't. Uh, and uh, well, I can see you've um, you've gone for some kind of head protection. Yeah, yeah of to stop that, stop stop the heat leave, leaving your head. And I was expecting our guest today to turn up in a hairnet, but that's Ooh. not the case, is it? No, <laughs> it's a different Sharples you're talking about ah, from a completely right. yes. different generation. Yeah. I'm sure another he's never heard century, that before. Another yeah. century <laughs> completely. Johnny Sharples, welcome to the Brazilian Journey podcast. Hello, thank you very much for having me. I am. I do live in a house that looks like it could be on Coronation Street. To be fair, we have um, back-to-back terrace that I live in, so uh, we, we share washing lines with the house behind. So I could easily, easily um, be mistaken for Ina, but no, not not quite as uh, aged, to put it politely. Well, at least you, you spend knew. your time in 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 local pub goss gossiping about the low <laughs> moral standards of the neighbours. Is that what you do? It is up on the uh, yeah. I live in I live in Bury, so not far away from uh, Weatherfield. Um, so yeah, it's uh, yeah, lo lovely Coronation Street vibes around here. I I do love those, but not quite back to back in the you know the sense of no back garden, but those very close knit. Uh, streets up in manchester because i lived in one um for, for a site for a time myself you know it's tiny tiny little gardens at the back and little alleyways where you take the dustbins out and people walk up and down you know literally sort of 10 feet away from your back window there's an alleyway with people walking up and down and everything i did love it it, it does they've modernized a lot of them um and it looks i don't know if you know that chimney pot era area of salford yeah, where they've sort of like taken those back-to-back -back type housing, but they've very much modernised them. And then you get it. Once you see what they've done with the gardens and everything, you sort of get the sense of community that it brings about. Big so, issue from the 60s, this, isn't it? Because what they're going to do, slum clearance, and a lot of the decisions were high-rise. I'm a, a kid who was I always lived in flats, and it's just natural for me. But there was a lot of resistance to it and a lot of thinking that, the houses that the kind of slum houses they could have been reformed from within retaining the sense of community that that you don't get so much in, in flats it's a for me it's a fascinating part of of post-war british social history i, I tell you where sorry no no you so go ahead I, johnny where i live so we i live on um uh, in a little a village uh, called Summer Seat, which is between Bury and Ramsbottom, if anyone knows that area. It's actually where Kieran Trippier um, is born, uh, is from and, and grew up. Um, but I, we're, our houses are a sort of like a tiny little enclave in the corner of the village. And uh, they used to be council housing. And we found out when we had to have some building work done on our house that this is where they would put the... Um, the worst effect the council tended to put the worst offenders because <laughs> it's so far away from the rest of civilization um that they could um could keep their eye on them and cause a, the least amount of trouble as possible i don't know if that's still true when we bought this house we were sort of tempted to move here by the fact that we were so hidden away from everyone else but yeah the the, the, the social history around the um around this part of Manchester and Lancashire it is fascinating um I'm not the really you, you need to get my wife on if you want to talk about that I'm afraid she's the historian of the two of us I'm um well I try and live in the current day as much as possible um but yeah she she likes social history and so it's well, broke off a bit you, you you live in the current day as much as possible but you are taking us back not that far five five and a half years you're taking us back to July the third down with the British uh 2018. England against Colombia, second round of the World Cup in Russia. Why have you chosen to take us there? So I think I'm a Newcastle fan um, as well as well as an England fan. But I think most of my uh, love of football was born in Euro 96, which is the first football tournament that I can really remember. Um, and it's the first sort of exposure that I can remember having to football. And... Um, what made me fall in love with football was that England team of, of Euro 96. And so I think for a lot of it, I'm a, almost an England fan first and foremost, um, 
and then Alan Shearer joined Newcastle and then I decided I was going to support Newcastle because he was the best player at Euro 96. Um, my first football memory is the heartbreak of that semi-final against Germany at Wembley and losing that penalty shootout. And I can really remember quite vividly sitting on the top of the bunk bed that I shared with my older brother um, in our bedroom and uh, England lost. And I remember when Gareth Southgate missed that penalty, being so upset and, and crying. And it's my first start, as you mean, to go on as a football fan, I suppose. Um, I just absolutely distraught. And to say I had no interest in football up until a couple of weeks before that match, it's quite interesting how quickly that emotion affected you and how quickly sort of your colours are pinned uh, to the mast of, of England. And so... The next time we won a penalty shootout, we obviously beat Spain in the in the uh, quarterfinals of Euro 96. It took until 2018 to win that next penalty shootout. And those demons for Gareth Southgate, and I suppose to a lesser extent for me, as compared to, to compared to Gareth, um, were eventually sort of uh, ridded, ridden um, in 2018 at that World Cup when we beat Colombia. But... I went back and watched the highlights and it was a slog to get to that, get to get to that, even get to that penalty shootout. I don't remember it being so bitty, that football match. But yeah, the, the reason I chose it is just because we exercised those demons however many, 22 years on or whatever it was. So yeah, a long time coming. Many, but well, I, I thought there's a lot more, there's a lot fewer penalty shootouts between the two than I remember. So um, yeah, but we got there eventually, and I think that's the main the main reason that I picked that match. And obviously, Tim, you're a, you're a South American football expert. You can you can offer Colombia's defence of their <laughs> antics throughout that match. Um... Flipping, are they going to jail? No matter what he says, <laughs> they're going to jail. Um, a couple of things first, though. And by the way, from the way you describe, you know, the younger you crying your eyes out, and then the redemption almost. Um, several years later at this point, after England had failed, you know, a few more penalty shoots out in between 96 and 2018. I feel from the way that you describe it, that there should be a play in that, you know, it's for you to write, obviously. Um, y you're the uh, king of the football memes on Twitter, aren't you? So it's for you to sort of find a way of turning that into a drama. It does sound actually... Uh, quite a fascinating journey. But um, when we're talking about this match in particular, because it was in Russia, it had a different feel about it. And I don't do you, do you remember the feel of the England team at the time? Um, when you look at the, um, you know, when you look at the players on the field, you're thinking, wow, gosh, I forgot about how strong that England side seemed. Uh, just from looking at the list of players. So what I really remember about it is that, and I think it could be with the benefit of hindsight, but and it could be a bit of a cliche, but there was the expectation going into that tournament was so low from what happened in 2016 and, you know, being knocked out by Iceland and Roy Hodgson possibly over uh, overstaying his welcome. And then we had the, the Sam Allardyce debacle, which again has, has created its own load of football memes which I'm obviously quite grateful for in, in, a in a Twitter sense but the expectation was quite low and Gareth Southgate had done his best to move on quite a lot of that team and I think when you look at it and you see you know Jordan Pickford, Harry Maguire, John Stones those names are quite established now but I think you forget just how few caps and how how soon before that tournament they were making their debuts and they were from, you know, Jordan Pickford's obviously still at Everton now, but Harry Maguire was at Leicester still. And it did underline the fact that Gareth Southgate at that point in time, I suppose, you can argue it's a bit different now, but was willing to make those big decisions and pick players from outside those, those more established Premier League sides. So I think there was a lesser expectation going into it. But those players obviously come on, grown with England, grown with Gareth Southgate, moved on to bigger sides now and um, no disrespect to Tottenham but you know Harry Kane's now at Bayern Munich and uh, <laughs> Harry Kane uh, Harry Maguire's <laughs> moved on to Manchester United for better or for worse well, but that yeah. team good question but you still had like you still had like uh, Danny Welbeck was still in the squad I think Gary Cahill Phil Jones 
Uh, Ashley Young was still in there. So there were still some of those players that had gone to 2016 and, and prior to 2012, I think. Ashley that's Young what really struck me, actually, looking at, looking at the lineup, just how much it's moved on. You know, it, how much Southgate has moved it on since. I mean, you, you mentioned Ashley Young, Lingard, Deli Alley, unfortunately, with what's happened to him, Vardy, you know, the, the, even Raheem Sterling, you know, the, the, there are players who no longer figure. You, you think of it as being Southgate's England, but in, in comparison, the Columbia side is very, very similar. The Columbia side these days it hasn't changed that much. You know, Luis Diaz has, has, has come in. Um, but there hasn't been a great deal of change, whereas Southgate has, has continually moved it on with England, and maybe not doesn't get enough credit for that. Yeah, I think I think people will focus on like the Jordan Jordan Henderson, Harry Maguire. You see a lot of stuff around, and my personal view is that Jordan Henderson shouldn't be in the England squad, regardless of whether he'd gone to play in Saudi Arabia or not. But I think it is difficult for an international manager to move on players because you only have two weeks with yeah. two weeks with them to establish a, a, a tactics and a mentality and things like that. And if these players are um, have that embedded in them, you keep them around because they know how the manager wants to play. They don't need that much tactical sort of figuring out. And you can't just pick someone on form because for like someone that's playing well for like. Uh, from in a Newcastle instance now, somebody like uh, Tino Liveramento or Sean Longstaff, who is playing above their level at the moment, there's nothing to say in six months' time they'll still be at that level and they'll still be good enough for England. Whereas you have seen Harry Maguire's Im re improved again, one player of the month recently for Manchester United. So he obviously has got that high level. But yeah, the the, the players he moved away is uh, like Eric Dyer played in that match and now he can't even get in the Tottenham team and um, yeah, JB Fox and he's obviously still, I think he's only 30-ish, 31 if that. So he should still be probably at his peak of England. Same with Raheem Sterling. So I think he is more cutthroat possibly than, you know, Gareth Southgate gets credit for a lot of the time. I think maybe it's, we're not used to an England manager being around for this long. Mm. So we're used to someone coming in with fresh ideas, new ideas and picking new players. So, um, yeah, but I have a lot of time for Gareth Southgate. Well, for th this tournament, I was in um, I was in Brazil up until the quarterfinals. And after the quarterfinals, I was back for the semis. And one of the things that really struck me was going out into the streets after England had lost to Croatia. And there was still a party going on. It was great. I actually loved it. It was brilliant. You know, it was a, there, there was a real, real, you know, yeah, we enjoyed the ride. And it was terrific. Um, but what was the feeling going in to this game against Colombia? Was uh, how, how much pressure was on? Was there an expectation of victory? I think because on, on the England side of the draw, it obviously already fallen quite nicely in place because the england Colombia match was the last of those second round fixtures. And on our side of the draw, there was Spain. And Spain had already gone out to Russia. So I think it was there was it was definitely going to be Russia, <clears throat> Russia, Croatia, Sweden, England or Colombia were definitely going to get to the final. And that was sort of a nice run. And Colombia were arguably, and I know we lost to Croatia, but at that point, Colombia seemed like the toughest team left and if we overcame Colombia the arrogant England fan in me thought yeah we've got a nice little <laughs> run to the final everyone else difficult Germany Germany already fallen by the wayside in the group stage everyone difficult's on that other side of the draw that's where France are that's where Argentina were that's where you know Portugal were so it's Brazil were on that side so Belgium were on that side so it just felt like everything seemed to be falling into place and I don't know if the same feeling I don't know if Tim knows in in Colombia whether those those other countries were sort of seeing the same thing. It's like if we overcome England, it's quite a nice route to the final. Well, the, the whole Colombia thing, and I can't really defend them very well, but I can I can try and put it in some kind of context because the whole thing revolves around James Rodriguez. The he whole the mood, pitch. the whole yeah. everything. They had him fit for one game, and it was the one before against Poland. When they absolutely thrashed Poland, uh, and it was one of the greatest performances by anyone in that World Cup, but he wasn't fit, and, and you didn't know that you that there were hints going into it, 
uh, is he going to be? Is he going to be on the bench? And then you know you saw he wasn't even even ready to 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 be on the bench, and that just knocked the whole thing. And and you could see on the the, the team that Colombia went with. Now I have huge respect for the coach Peckham and Argentine Argentine when he he developed a lot of when he was Argentina's youth coach he developed and and did it very idealistically generations of great players in the late in the late through the late 90s and then he was in charge of Argentina and he took them to the 2006 World Cup but I've always doubted him in the big games like the one in the 2006 World Cup um the when they they lost the quarter final on penalties against Germany and he didn't bring on Messi and I think he blew his substitutions in, in, in the game. And I think he was too cautious. And here, he hasn't got James Rodriguez. So what does he do? He picks a nasty side. You know, he picks three defensive midfielders. What, what His team is saying, England are better than we are. We might be able to snatch something, but England England are better than we are. And it's, it, 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 it's a nasty side that he, that, that he picks. Uh, and you can see that this comes from the top at half time when one of his coaching staff has a little shove on is it right Raheem Sterling on there. No, this this is premeditated they thought this out you know and it was so disappointing for me from um from Peckerman you know you think of as an idealistic coach that his team took took that attitude uh, so uh, you really see the limitations of 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 uh, Colombia without James Rodriguez. They're not the same side technically, and they're not the same side mentally either. But maybe you also see the limitations of of England as well, because England couldn't put them away, and should have done. I remember I've just gone back to my notes watching the game at the time, and I said the three centre back system looks look, looks not flexible enough, which I think we found out in the semis against Croatia. I think Gareth admitted it really in the semis against Croatia, that a side that could keep the ball, that could re- retain the ball as Croatia did, they turned that back three into a back five and 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 found little pockets to 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 pass to pass round. So uh, it, it's a game in the end that I think highlighted the limitations of both sides. Although England were clearly better and really should have have put it to bed before the absolute insane drama of stoppage time at, at at the end of 90. So I just remember, like, it's one of those things, I think it happens quite a lot in football. So Jordan Pickford made that incredible save that when you watch the replay, he didn't need to make. It wasn't going in if you follow the trajectory of the ball, but it's an incredible save for the cameras. And it's one of those things, It's <clears throat> I play a lot of football manager a lot of FIFA and it's one of the things that you can it's almost like you can tell in the animation of the game when the goal is going to come and it's when they lined up for that corner after uh, Pickford had made that save it's like I think they're probably they're going to score because Mina had scored already scored two in that tournament um, and he was massive he, it felt almost like he was ta- even Maguire is a big man with a big head but it felt like Yerry Mina was <laughs> towering over all of England's defense when that corner came in and it's not a particularly good header from him he, I think he he heads it down so it hits the ground too early but obviously that works in his favor because it bounces up over Kieran Trippier on the line and yeah that just felt like it, 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 it felt was like pretty that was much all, done. all they had wasn't it because they're trying to get back into the game. Um, Peckerman looks at his bench and he thinks, who can get back into the, who can get us back into the game? Ah, Carlos Backer, the striker. Backer can, backer can, backer can. So <laughs> on comes Carlos Backer. <laughs> he, he goes to he goes to three centre backs. And Quadrado, who'd been kind of up front alongside alongside Falcão, goes to right wing back. Uh, and one of the things with the three centre backs. In the end, it just frees Mina to be to be centre forward. You know, up you go, up you go. So all the, all they've got is like throwing throwing crosses in. And as you said, there's that wonderful volley from Uribe from distance that Pickford turns round corner, and it, it's the only way that you could imagine the goal the goal coming. You know, Maguire should have should have should have stood on his boots, shouldn't he? You know, but this was the World Cup with VAR. They're looking at it. 
how did England get their their goal? And this was something that Southgate, because Southgate is a very clever fella, and he's a national team coach. And as you said, John, it's just it's a different thing from being a club coach. And he'd done all of his statistics. And the conclusion that they come to, that even like the really ball-playing sides like Spain, tournaments, the vital games, the goals are coming from set pieces. They, they, they're coming from, from corners. And all of this was worked out. And where did England goal come from? It was a penalty on a corner where, where Carlos Sanchez is, is, looks like he's trying, to, he's trying to wear Harry Kane's shorts, which already have an owner. Oh, that, that 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 that's deemed illegal, correctly so. Uh, and and where 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 do England concede from a from a corner? Uh, maybe they haven't worked out the strategy of blocking Mina as 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 well as they should have done, because you, you couldn't see where else the goal was going to come. Did you see that Mina free oh, the free kick against Mina early on, where he's clearly handballed it, and uh, he. Or obviously doesn't know that VAR has seen it because <laughs> his hand is actually outstretched to stop the ball. He should have got more than a yellow card for that. But you saw him say to the ref, nah, it wasn't my hand, ref. It's my chest. That's old school. Did you think, when the equaliser went in, Johnny, did you think we've thrown it away? Or did you think, no, we'll see him off in extra time? No, because... It... I've had years years of being an England fan and it's like, as soon as that goal goes in, it's like the whole deflation and it's like, we've got not got a chance now because like they're, they're going to, we're going to, our heads will drop going into the sort of the team talk at full time. They're, they're going to be on a high now. It's all going to go terribly wrong. And I think extra time was quite even between the two teams. England had a chance with Danny Rose and I, uh, even now, watching the highlights back, I swear it's going to go in mm-hmm. every time. It looks like it's going to go in and it just goes wide. But, yeah, it's um, it, that pessimism just never, ever... England could win four or five World Cups. The next five World Cups, the sixth World Cup, I'll be convinced that we're going to go out in the group stage. <laughs> I think that's the thing. I think it comes from being a Newcastle fan as well. Years and years of that closeness. close, And it's getting worse for England now because and it's going to get worse again for Newcastle. That That glimpse of glory but never quite achieving it is a is a nice place to be because you always have that belief but it's a horrible place to be because you'll never have that success and I think for England that's definitely how it felt like we were we were so close to winning it and it just went wrong in the last minute and now it's all going to go wrong Mm -hmm. and this is our we're on the good side of the draw this is our best chance to win it and it's all gone wrong and that's just how it that's just how it felt that's how it that's, always feels that's england football culture though isn't it you, you, you're not going to change that it's like in colombia I, I i thought it was what was surprising for me about the way they approached the game uh, without hamas rodriguez who the cameras focused on throughout this mm. match you know they're like oh i wonder what hamas rodriguez is thinking <laughs> now every few <laughs> seconds but i thought that they were going to be a skillful team uh, because if you look to a lot of the uh Columbia fans or some of them they wore sort of Carlos Valderrama wigs didn't they and that's yeah. the image that you have that's the classic image of Colombia certainly that we I, have... I think I think El Cole was there okay. El Cole's legendary El Cole is, is this fan and he was there when they went to Italia 90 and he dresses up like a bird and what he, <laughs> what, what, he, what he used to do, they've stopped the elf and safety. It closed him down. Eh? But what he used to do, he used to, he used to find ways to, to strap a kind of cable to the roof of the stadium and he'd hang upside down and he'd flap his wings dressed like, 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 like a bird. And he made a kind of profession out of it. Uh, he, he, uh, he got sponsored by a, by a brewery. Uh, I called him the Birdman of Alcohol. Uh, and you, every every Columbia tournament, you you always see him there, but you see a lot of them as well. And uh, I, I, I noticed this for the first time, um, the Copa America of 2011 in Argentina, because a lot of Copa Americas, when the hosts weren't playing, there was no one in the stadium. Suddenly you could see, that, see the continent beginning to get richer and Colombia had a traveling army. And uh, and the, the work, this particular World Cup, a number of South American 
Mexicans were Latin American fans. Some of them living in in, in the states it was just immense. I mean, in in the group stage, it was England's group when Panama played Belgium. Panama had more supporters in the stadium than Belgium did in Russia. Incredible. So normally you would expect, you know, this is the World Cup in Europe. You'd expect England to have the stadium, and I don't think that 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 was the case at all. You know, I think it was at least. 50-50 in this huge traveling army of, of Columbia fans. And you're right, they've got they've got that idea that they've got that 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 thing of of uh ticky tacky ticky tacky around Valderrama. Mm-hmm. But you look at this side and they're not going to do a lot of that in the midfield. What they're going to do is they're, they're going to mark, they're going to on Jefferson Lerma, for example, is almost like a symbol of the side, this huge wardrobe. He can play a bit, but he's a huge wardrobe. Carlos Sanchez, one of the, the best man markers around for a while. Um, Wilmar Barrios, a really tough, tough little player. So you know from the kickoff, it's going to be competitive, and they're going to, they're going to fight all the way. And I was looking at some of the uh, the time. I wrote down some of the instant responses from the the, the, the Colombian press. Um, most of them were, were good. You know, we 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 leave uh, Russia uh, with our boots on. Thanks, lads. Uh, we go home for, with, with, with pride, with the satisfaction of of, of uh, having left it all out there. Uh, a united, brave team is in tears. Uh, one dissenting voice, uh, in football terms, Colombia only woke up to insult the ref. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see there the two sides of, of, of South American football, you know, coming together because Harry Kane to take the penalty that England that England uh, took the lead with the penalty in in just uh, early in the second half there's a massive massive delay and uh, some of that is var and a lot of that is colombia trying to destroy the penalty spot i heard yeah, about I that think, sorry go on it's quite strange because when you think like you see it now and i think i can't remember who it was on some coverage it might have been at the last world cup but describing someone as a typical south american side but there's two, like you say, there's two different sides of a coin to what is a typical South American side. Either the flair angels and, and everything. demons, yeah, or it's the how Colombia were in that match, which is those niggly little fouls every so often that just disrupt anything that England were trying trying to do. Um, so yeah, it, it's this strange sort of paradigm that there is between what do you mean when you say a typical South American side? You can never be too sure what someone means. And you never say a typical European side because we acknowledge that there's so many different ways that football is to be played, but you will hear it on the, on commentary. Um, so yeah. We, we, we've gone to penalties, John, and the by and large, the, the stats, they're very, very weighted in favour of the team that takes the first penalty. Remember, FIFA tried to try to change this around a little bit to, to you know, they, they, they tried to have this alternate system, um, but it was just too complicated for anyone anyone to remember. Uh, but Colombia take the first penalty, and Colombia score with their first three penalties, and Jordan Henderson with a third penalty steps up, and Ospina saves it. At that point, it's all over, isn't it? Yeah, especially like if you think. Is Jordan Henderson our third best penalty taker? And if that's the third best we've got, I'm not looking forward to four and five. And it wasn't a very good penalty. He completely shapes his body and telegraphs where he's going to put it. All Ospina has to do is go the right way, which he does. And it is just at that point, you're looking at the list of people that haven't taken a penalty yet. And um, I suppose there's only really Jamie Vardy that you've, that I would personally have any sort of hope in in taking one and scoring it because he has a, he had a decent record for Leicester and obviously ultimately he doesn't end up taking one at all. But yeah, at that point it's like well they've Colombia have taken three very good penalties, England have taken two decent penalties and then Henderson's and it's all happening all over again. Like this is Paul Lintz, this is Batty, this is Waddle, this is. Everyone that's a Carragher, everyone that's ever missed a penalty, this is this is it. This, we've lost it now. And I suppose in one sense, because Jordan Pickford was quite a new goalkeeper for England. You don't, and he's never faced a penalty shootout before for England, the England full t- uh, national team. You don't really know if he's got that capability. 
as I remember when he was on, I can't remember who he was on loan at. It might have been Carlisle. I don't know. I remember seeing him, he played against Preston when I used to live in Preston. I went to watch this match and it's one of the worst goalkeeping performances that I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. And that came against Preston, who are by and large an awful team. Um, so I, I think it's one of those things that always sticks with you. He, and he's from Sunderland. He always gives it large to Newcastle fans. <laughs> he's already in the bad books anyway. And so it's like, what is he going to be able to pull something out the back? Are we going to have to rely on one of the Colombians hitting the crossbar or just missing the target completely? And then obviously the next penalty. It, it, it's the decisive moment, isn't it? Because if Uribe scores, Colombia are there practically. They're four, two up, you know, uh, and they're there. And Uribe strikes a good ball. And that that volley right at the end, that magnificent long-range volley that Jordan Pickford turns around for the corner from where Mina scores, that was Uribe. So you're backing him. When he steps forward to, to, to take the penalty, you're backing him. He's one of the ones you think, yeah. And it's so close to being the perfect penalty because... If you get it low in the corner, there's a chance, you know, if the keeper it, it goes early and goes well, if you get it high in the corner, there's absolutely no chance. You know, three goalkeepers won't save it, but no one has ever missed a penalty for hit for hitting it too low. You know, and just the extra little bit of adrenaline that you take up because of the importance of the occasion, you just calibrate it just a little bit wrongly. And instead of being absolutely the perfect penalty right in the top corner, it's back off the bar and England are back in it. Yeah, there's a terrible moment where you sort of think when it's coming back down off the bar, Jordan Henderson's, sorry, Jordan Pickford's gone the right way. Is it going to hit Jordan Pickford and end up in the net? Again, pessimism uh, yeah. come, like shines through. But yeah, luckily, and then upsets Kieran Trippier. And again, he's one of them... He's not made his debut long long before. You know, He's come through like a lot of the England players have done sort of the, the Football League system. He was at <clears throat> dropped down to Burnley, made his way back up again to Tottenham. And it's like we don't I've never seen him take a penalty. He took a good he took a decent free kick mm, earlier on in the scored. match. Nearly scored. Yeah. yeah. Obviously then against Croatia he does score his free kick. But um yeah, no idea what his penalty taking is like, whether he's capable, how he stri- how he's a good crosser, but how does he strike the ball? And yeah, then that goes in and it's like, well we're back even now, but it's only one penalty left each. And so it's all on this. Because and then it's, I don't Car- know. It's, it's Carlos Backer, striker. And again, his penalty is so close to being to being really good. Because he's identified that Pickford is gonna is gonna choose a side. So if the goalkeeper chooses a side, then the place that he cannot stop it is high down the middle. Can't stop it. So but this is, I think this is Backer's thought process, high down the middle. But I think he's he's just watched Uribe, just calibrate it, just that little wrong, bit wrong and getting it too high, right? So I'm going to go high down the middle, but I'm not going to go too high. And it goes for the, the goalkeeper. <laughs> yes. So Pickford diving, his foot is just able to, to to block it. It's another one that had it been just that little bit, you know. Half a metre higher, it's a goal. Instead of which, Pickford has, has, has made his save. And lo and behold, it's Eric Dyer to step up. What are you thinking? I was fully expecting Jamie, like, like I say, Jamie Vardy was on the pitch. And he's not taken one to four. So he's saving him for the fifth one, which again is always a ris- risky move to save one of your good penalty takers for fifth. And you see Eric Dyer strolling down the pitch. And he's... Uh, in Euro 2016, he scored free kick. Um, so he can he has got some capabilities that you think are possibly beyond him. Um, but he's not who I would have expected to step up. And it's not it's it's not the best penalty in the world. I always think when it's the sort of penalty that you can imagine Peter Crouch or Andy Carroll taking. They look awkward when they take they strike a penalty because they're too tall. Um, but yeah, Dyer sort of hits it. Scuffs, scuffs it a bit, and it's I've been is so close to getting it. I think I think he gets a full hand on it, but it's just the power of Eric Dyer. Obviously, mm. <laughs> just takes it, takes it past him, and yeah, I can't, 
it's one of their moments. And I think it's a bit like the Pickford save. Pickford almost dives past the ball and yeah. just sticks his hand out and manages to get it. It's the same as that Danny Rose shot. Like I say, you watch it a million times and convince yourself that that one's going in. Pickford's not saving it. And Ospina is. And they're all wrong. Um, mm. But looking back now, it's like, I th- like uh, the Euro 2020 final and the Nations League um, semi is it the semi-final or, or the third, fourth place playoff? Harry Maguire can take an amazing penalty and he was still on the pitch. So do had his uh, abilities not been noticed yet? Or is it just not? No, but again, if he was stepping up for the fifth penalty at that point in time, we didn't have the benefit of hindsight of these two penalties he's taken. That would have scared me to Whoever stepped up would have scared me to death at that point. But, you know, that goes in and it's just... I think it takes a minute to sink in that England have won a penalty shootout and England are going through to play Sweden. And it's, yeah, it's incredible. And it spawned incredible celebrations and then the best montage that the BBC have ever put out as well. So you can't say fairer than that, really. Yeah, a a montage of the the years of hurt uh, is included with the year of triumph or the moment of triumph. I can't still get my head around what it must have been like for the Colombian fans, though, Tim, given that, you know, whatever the, you know, the chutzpah of the Colombia media might have been, but the fans would have been disappointed by that performance. Oh, yeah, just a, just a bit, because win the penalty shootout, there's a, there's just a, a couple more days there, a few more days to get Hammers fit for Sweden. We'll take them on. Uh, and... As, as Johnny has said, you know, the gates of paradise are starting to to open up a little bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it, it, you know, it's, it's a terrible, terrible way to, to lose a football match. On the balance of the 120, I don't think anyone could complain. I think England were were, were the better side. And, and as I said earlier, I was very disappointed with how little Colombia wanted to, wanted to, to, to play. Um, I wrote myself at the time that they'd swap creativity for bravery, you know, for yeah. kind of machismo. Uh, and that, that that was disappointing because I think there was a squad there that even in the absence of Hammers were capable of of, of a little bit, a little yeah, bit well, more. What happened to Foucault? Because he, at that point, he was one of the best footballers yeah, in the world, he's, wasn't he? But he's, he's a striker uh, and he, mm. he's not going to create from nothing. Is uh, you, you've got you've got to give him service. You, you've got to get the ball in for for him to attack, and with with the midfield that they picked, they didn't leave themselves a lot of options to do that. Hence the fact that you know in the end when they're chasing the game, up goes Mina, and you know let, let let's just let's throw throw the ball in there. So as you're celebrating there, Johnny, and you're back to back streets, in and out of each other's houses, lending each other sugar. Um, are, are you now dreaming of going all the way? I think you'd be like. Our, our dear friends in Scotland, Wales and Ireland obviously always say that we've got ideas above our station as England fans. But I think once you've got past that mental hurdle of the penalty shootout and you look at who else is left in our side of the draw, I think you'd be foolish not to be dream- Like, And the whole point of being a football fan is that you have these big dreams that one day your team will win something. And there's only one Premier League to win every year. And there's only one World Cup to win every four years. So you've got to try and pin your hopes on that. Even if you are whoever, if you're Sheffield United or Luton this season, you've got, a sh- you've got to hope in like somewhere in the recesses of your mind that something might go your way and you'll win the Premier League. Otherwise, what's the point of being a football fan? So as an England fan, when you see that side of the draw open up and you've got past that mental barrier of, of a penalty shootout and playing a team that are going to be a bit niggly here and there. Yeah, of course you want, you've got fantasies of going on and, and lift, seeing Harry Kane lift the World Cup. You'd be, I think you'd, you'd be a bit silly not to really. But my main focus after that was the fact that I couldn't sleep for hours and hours and hours afterwards because the adrenaline I have a I have a smartwatch nowadays and it tells me when I'm stressed <laughs> and it says you need this is a relaxed reminder remember to do some breathe do some breathing exercises to calm yourself down and um, when Newcastle were playing PSG at their Parc de Prince a couple of weeks ago and it was getting to the final minutes of that match and Newcastle were one nil up 
my my watch buzzed and that came up saying <laughs> you you're stressed calm down <laughs> so i think if i had this watch when england had played colombia that penalty shootout it possibly would have malfunctioned and just exploded and i think that would have been a good reminder but yeah i was i'd i've i'd worked the i was working the england matches at that world cup so um i would go on a i'd was working for a company i'd go on their twitter account and throughout england the hour before to an hour afterwards i'd tweet throughout the england matches doing memes and stuff like that and i did not enjoy it in the slightest because i found it very i'd rather do one good one good tweet every day than 10 okay tweets for but you don't get paid to do one tweet so but i just remember for the last half an hour maybe of that match I couldn't. I could. I couldn't even bear to look at, at Twitter. I couldn't even think of anything other than. Oh, I hope we don't mess this <laughs> up. So yeah, it was just that adrenaline from that match just meant that I could not. I don't think I got to sleep until three o'clock ish in the morning. And um, my, she was my girlfriend then, my wife now. She was like, um, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> I was like, well, England won a penalty shootout. She's like, yeah, they should be happy. Should be happy. That shouldn't stop you from sleeping. I'm like, no, it just won't go away. It will never go. So, yeah, but I, but I thought you said, I think you'd be, you'd be silly not to at least hope and dream that you you could win that trophy, especially when things went the way that they did. But little did we know that Croatia was secretly the best team in the world well the second best ultimately um but um yeah heart, heart, it, it won't be england is this, without is this the most tense england game that you've ever lived through and even more than the final the euro final against italy so the euro, the euro final because we went one nil up so early and i again my partner shouted at me because i cheered the goal too loud and our three cats ran across different <laughs> different parts of the room because i just celebrated too loudly um yeah i think again that pessimism was there as soon as Bonucci scored and it was just like oh well, we're not gonna win now are we <laughs> so um and then again a penalty shootout as much as we've done well in other penalty shootouts it's still there but yeah this this is the worst i've ever I think going extra time going against Croatia was quite bad, um, but yeah, this was this was this was hor- horrible in <laughs> in the nicest way. But this is why you want to watch football though, because those mm-hmm. emotions come out of you, and those sort of that roller coaster of things are so bad, oh things are going to be terrible, and then things aren't as bad as you imagined, or they're actually quite good sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, that's always there, and that's what keeps you going. But yeah, it was. It was horrible, but it, it throughout the until the final whistle, and then it's nice. But then again, you what you're thinking it, that penalty? He doesn't save that penalty, or Dyer misses that penalty. How different it could have been. Yeah. Um. So mm-hmm. if if we could mm-hmm. just win like three nil every match, it would just be such make life so much easier. You know how horrible that was. Well, I hate to tell you this, but the. Pop charts on July the third, <laughs> two thousand and eighteen. They are a little bit horrible. Some more horror to come. So we always. Um, and by the way, you, you, what's your podcast called? I don't have one. I mean, Tommy, who's your producer, used to do a podcast. All the episodes are still available. Uh, it was called Your Fest, which was uh, we get guests on to describe their fantasy music festival. So if people still want to go back and listen to that, which me and Tommy did a lot during lockdown. The episodes are still there. You can hear me and Tommy. Tommy talk a lot about terrible indie bands and me talk a lot about terrible punk bands. So that's still there. Well, let's, let's talk about terrible pop bands then. Um, <laughs> so July the 3rd, 2018. I don't know how you feel about George Ezra. He's at number one with Shotgun. Um, my only thought on him, well, I have two thoughts. One, my now wife used to love him, um, so I don't like him for that particular reason. <laughs> and sec- secondly, Shotgun, um, when Salomon Rondon played for Newcastle, Newcastle had a chant to the tune of uh, Shotgun by um, George Ezra. So those are my only two opinions on George Ezra. Not not by Junior Walker and the All-Stars. That's a, that's a proper shotgun. <laughs> well, there are lots of shotguns. There's a shotgun wedding as well by Roy C., But the thing about this shotgun is that it's for kids. It's for the kids. And there's a lot in this chart that's for the kids. Exactly. The top 10 is for the kids, uh, essentially, apart from maybe one 
uh, or two tracks. Um, for and when I mean kids, I mean perhaps uh, junior school kids. Um, I would say by secondary school, you know, you've left all those childish ways behind, haven't you? Shotgun is about um, riding shotgun in a car because I know because my daughter says, "Oh no, I'm shotgun." No, no, I'm shotgun. But it is a hook, though. It's a decent hook, isn't it? I'd say so that's you know like I say it's a Newcastle had a chant based around it and all the you need a good hook to if you're gonna use the tune of a, a song to make a football chant it needs a good hook and it needs to be catchy so I think that's obviously what it had going for it in that sense little else I would hasten to say but you know Fair it's enough, strange but... isn't it because it's kind of singer songwriter with all these like space invader type noises it's worse in Paradise, is it? The other track that he's got in the charts, it's worse that I think this one is more straightforward than that. But it's the only memorable one out of the top 10. Can you remember any of the others? Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm looking here at uh, number... Oh, yeah, the, the, the Calvin Harris Dua Lipa one. That's one not bad. Kiss. That's well, not it's kind bad. of lasted, isn't it? You know, it's that, that's, I think that, that's still around. I don't know if um, either of you, well, I'm sure you know, Johnny, who XXX Tintassian is. I'm sort of aware of who he is. He's um, not my forte would be his sort of uh, SoundCloud rapper sort of stuff. Exactly. And he passed, passed away a few years ago, didn't he? I remember well, 2002 by Anne-Marie. Look at, I'm just looking at it now. Um, very adolescent and, pop, isn't it? Yeah, what it's there I for. don't. Do not know any of the. I know the names of the people that are, are in the charts, but you, the you, songs you've obviously themselves. got something to say about this XXX Tentacion. Well, yeah, uh, because th these charts have come out just about a week or two, just a couple of weeks after he was shot dead in a horrible, horrible, horrible way, um, and he would never have made the charts probably if it hadn't been for his death. But he's got about four songs, is it, in these charts, which shows. Just what Johnny was saying about um, social media pop stars, I guess you would call them, um, coming through doing like 100 songs on SoundCloud, which at the time was something of the platform that you would load up your new music to. And you could build a following very, very quickly like that. And he was from Florida, I think it was, via Jamaica. And um, he and his uncle went to buy a motorcycle so there's pictures of him in his last moments at this motorcycle shop. They've already been clocked by some people who think, right, he's got cash on him. And they just slaughter them in the cars. The uncle manages to get away. But XXX Tentacion, you know, gone. And you can see him a little bit nervous about one of the two of the guys that had come into the motorcycle shop, you know, the video that they've got there. Anyway, that's why he's in the charts. But his music is forgettable. I think it's fair to say. And uh, that is the same with pretty much most of the music there until you get to maybe number 19. Are you a Skepta fan, Johnny? I'm not. Again, I've some 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 bits and pieces of his music has sort of uh, penetrated my bubble. Um, but sort of gone out of my way to um, to listen to particularly like I'm scrolling down because we've got the top 100 and I think it doesn't until we get to where is it 42 is a song that I would probably listen to and it's three lions <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, on 20. at number 44 though is something interesting Childish Gambino uh, this is America All right, uh, yeah yeah. I'll tell you why this for me is interesting. It had an amazing video, I seem to remember at the time, mm -hmm. um, shot in a warehouse and stuff like that. But when I heard it now, this is the first time I'd actually thought about it because I didn't think he was that great a rapper. But you know what? He is. He sounds exactly like David Byrne. And this could be, you know, this could be a Talking Heads track, except with like a, a rap more than a talk, yeah. as yeah. David Byrne would do. He sounds exactly the same. I couldn't believe it. I thought, mm -hmm. whoa. Now I get what he, um, he, he's got something to say. He has. He? Not always, um, but on this occasion. Yeah, on the, this one. On, the, the, on that, that one really cut through, didn't it? It, it? it seemed like there were very, very powerful points being being made there. When Ones that kind of leapt out for me from the, the top 20. Is it EO? 
German, yeah. and the uh, the 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 praise the Lord thing. Just praise how, the Lord, Just how sociopathic they are. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It, it is sociopathic. It's like I, I take all all that's mine, and then I take more. Uh, yeah. And I've got this German car, and I've got this German. Uh, you know, if if that's where we are, then there's something has gone badly, badly wrong. And I think in comparison with Childish Gambino, who is trying to make a point, I don't think that the comparison works well for the, for 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 our lads. What about number seventy-seven, Johnny? Shape of You, Ed Sheeran. No, I hate Ed Sheeran with every fibre of my being. When me and my wife got married a few months ago, I, um, we had to give the DJ a list of songs um, that we did and didn't coming. want him to play. And every <laughs> on, underlined was anything by Ed Sheeran was underlined. And we very did, we came did she very go along close. with that? Yes, we yeah. came very close <laughs> to laminating a sign that says at the request of the bride and groom, no Ed Sheeran will be played at this wedding. Had had she not got along with that, would you have gone through with the wedding? Was that a deal breaker? She's, she's put up with a lot from me, um, Twitter and uh, ob- obsession with Alan Shearer. So I think I can make some allowances here and there. But um, uh, no, I think, yeah, I look actually in the, I know it's not the same week, but I went and found my um, top songs from 2018 on Spotify for, for obviously from this year. And the, my second most played song in 2018 was World in Motion, which I think gives you an, an idea <laughs> no of just idea. how yeah. how into the uh, into the World Cup, into England that I managed to get. And so, and your uh, your third most played song of 2018 was Back Home. <laughs> we'll be thinking about you. <laughs> we can go on and on and on and on. No, no, but that that really is a tribute to the beauty of World in Motion, isn't it? Because it's not funny sing along like like Three Lions, you know. And it, it it's not it's not kitsch like back home. There's something beautiful. There's something spiritual about it. I think world in motion. I think the best thing about it is if it didn't have even if it did have John John Barnes's rap, but it was amended slightly. And he says in it, it's not a football song, but you could. It's it's not a football song. It's just a good or a, a decent New Order song, just with a bit of a rap tacked onto the end of it. And you know John Barnes in the video with Keith Allen. So yeah, I think the the best thing that you can say about that football song is that it does not sound like a football song. Sorry to go back to the Ed Sheeran. I know you love <laughs> this, Johnny. Just uh, bear with me on this. It makes sense. Shape of You has been perhaps the most controversial newly written song of this century. I would say because about 10 different, or at least about 10 different people came out and said, you've nicked that from my tune. And the two big ones were TLC, the writers of TLC's No Scrubs. And it's not until you listen to both songs, you realise what has happened here. But interestingly enough, Ed Sheeran... My sweet scrubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not that one. He's not so fine, is he? He's not so fine. No, 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 he's a dog. The scrubs they're talking about. But when you hear what they've taken off, which is some of the chords, um, et cetera, um, you understand why Ed Sheeran had to subsequently post the release, add their names on as songwriters, the two women that wrote it who were the songwriters for TLC. But then this other guy, oh God, what was that guy's name? I can't remember now. Uh, took him to court and said, you know, you've nicked it off me. And Ed Sheeran fought that case. And actually that one, you can hear probably more clearly <laughs> that it sounds like Shape <laughs> of You. But Ed Sheeran won, interestingly enough. So mm. it clearly wasn't a uh, shape of view. But I'm just saying that for me, musically, that's an interesting um, anecdote around this song. It, it's it's likely to happen more and more and more. There's only so many notes and chords and so many only so many ways that you can put them together. But there are so many... It, no, oh, sorry, the last part of what you said, there are um, untold ways of way, how you can put them together. Because there's a lot of things going on, syncopations going on, um, which is timing, essentially. You can play around with that. Uh, you can play around also with the stress that you have on the chords, or you can play yeah, around with... Yeah, it's the same with... chords and the same notes. No, you can, yeah, you, you yeah, can but salad there are chords it. within chords. There are chords within... I mean, 
a, a C minor is not the same as a C sharp. And then you've got a C minor, F sharp kind of thing. I mean, I don't know all the chords, so I'm not a musician, but I'm saying that there are chords within chords. Once you start multiplying all those um, various possibilities, you'll find that it's infinite. So I, I, I don't believe that you're bound to. The reason why people replicate things is not because they've run out of options. It's because that one sold. So, ooh, that works but very also, nice. And sometimes you don't know. I mean, McCartney, for example, when he wrote yesterday, he thought, I must have nicked that. It's just, you know, it just come fully formed in my head. I must have got it off someone. And he, he asked, do you know this song, tune? you know this tune? And no one did. And then, all right, yeah. All right, then it's mine. I love it. I think the worst thing is not Paul McCartney. It's George Harrison's claim that he didn't know that um, My Sweet Lord was exactly the same as <laughs> She's So he's Fine. He's so fine. No, yeah, that, he's yeah, so yeah, fine. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Schiffens. Now, come on. <laughs> These guys, they listen to everything that came yeah, out of Yeah, but you listen America. to so much, you don't even know exactly where it came from. Do, you do, do you? when it's an entire melody, though, don't you? Yeah, well, maybe. It was maybe. my sweet lord. He's so fine. <laughs> I really want it. You yeah. know, Tim, you Chiffons can't... Never, ne Chiffons never went on about Harry Krishna, did they? Give him that. <laughs> you know, give them that. Anyway, so we all agreed that these, chart, these charts... It's not very even, good. Uh, well, it's not for us, is it? It's not for us. I mean, if, if we were if we were 11, we, yeah, we, we might have exactly. a different perspective. Exactly. Um, so you agreed on that, Johnny? Yeah, it's interesting. Like I say, I found my top songs from 2018. It's interesting the conversation we just had because quite high up on my list is Given to Fly by Pearl Jam, which sounds exactly like Going to California by Led Zeppelin. But I really like Given to Fly by Pearl Jam and I don't like Going to California by Led Zeppelin. That's so it's interesting, interesting isn't how, it? That's how it works, isn't it? Yeah, that is interesting. The person who's like that in these charts is Post Malone. I mean, he'll do one track, Circles, for example, which is a boom track if you listen to it. He's in the charts with about 10 different songs in these charts, and I couldn't find one that was anywhere near it. And I'm like, is this the same guy? But it is. Um, sometimes you love them, sometimes you hate them. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on uh, this edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. In terms of the charts, we have to say, like that famous guy who took one of Elvis Presley's records and said, rock and roll has got to go, and then smashed it on the table. <laughs> but as far as the match was concerned, from a Colombian perspective, what a dirty load of footballers. <laughs> dirty, rotten footballers. What, just just to, to, to close... What's your relationship with, in these big tournaments, how much of an England fan are you? Me? Me? Yeah. No, no, no. I think, we, Johnny, we know your answer. <laughs> what we don't know is Uncle D's. Well, funny enough, you and I were on the World Football phone-in this week, and you were going round the table um, with Julia Bellas Trinidad and um, I'll give you your opinion on who were the favourites uh, for for the Euros. The Euros yeah. I was the only one who was about to, but you never gave me a chance to say, I reckon You're the presenter. You can, you can hog the I mic as much as you want. <laughs> but I think... You played a victim with the me, conversation, The conversation moved <laughs> on. So I missed the moment to say, England are my favourites, and England is who I'm supporting. Um, I remember, was it 2004, the World Cup in... Uh, Japan and uh, 2002 sorry, 2002 yeah the World Cup in Japan and Korea when England lined up to play Brazil on that I think it was a Friday morning here our time you know very early um it, it was 2002 wasn't it then yeah, we played Brazil. yeah don't you mind about very early it was four hours earlier for me <laughs> hey you can come home, you know. We're not <laughs> keeping you out there. For goodness sake. Anyway, when when England lined up to play Brazil on that morning, I remember it very well. So my older daughter would have been four years old, and she asked me, who are you supporting? And I'll be real, you know, for after sort of uh, 35 years of hurt as a black British person, Brazil was our team. Brazil, as you know, Brazil was the black 
British team, just like the West Indies in cricket. And that, you know, was the point, I think, that Norman Tebbit might have been trying to make, but he didn't make the full point, which is why are these black football supporters supporting Brazil or uh, West Indies in cricket? But on that morning, when my daughter asked me, who are you supporting? And I said, Brazil, of course. My missus gave me this evil eye and said, how can you say that? Look at those footballers out there. And that was the first time I ever saw the black England footballers, you know, in in, in what they represent. Yeah. And um, half of the footballers that were lining up against Brazil were, you know, black, mixed heritage, whatever you want to say, of African heritage. And my wife said, they're representing her, not you. They're representing her. How can you say that? That's her generation. And something really uncomfortable uh, sank into me. And from that moment on, I've supported England because I think it's the right team to support for who I am what I represent in this country and, you know, my family. Um, but if England are playing Nigeria, I'm afraid <laughs> it goes out the window. Which they did in 2002. So. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's my story. Anyway, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. We shouldn't end with me. Uh, just a final word from you, Johnny, on this, on the match, July the 3rd. Um, yeah, so those charts all gave me sleepless nights in a different way to the England match did, I think, <laughs> in hindsight. Um, but no, it was, I think that, that penalty shootout has almost been the peak of my time supporting England. I know we've reached, that's the semi-final against Denmark was, Euro 2020 was touch and go with the uh, Harry Kane missing the penalty and then scoring it. But I don't think it's ever got any... Like as a Newcastle fan, it's never got any better than Philippe Albert chipping Peter Schmeichel when Newcastle beat Man United 5-0 in, in 1996. And as an England fan, I don't think it's ever going to get better. All that pent-up frustration if, that's been there. If it does get better, you'd love it, wouldn't you? You'd love it. You'd love it if it was, was going to get better. It's just a shame Kevin Keegan's not still England exactly, manager. Exactly. <laughs> to, to get rid of his own demons. But yeah, that match was scrappy and terrible and horrible and probably one of the best moments of being a football fan not just an England fan it's summed up everything that's good and bad about supporting England and liking football and you can see it on YouTube thank you gentlemen thank you very much